everybody, and uh, as you can see, my last name is Lee, but I'm not Korean. Uh, actually, I'm Chinese. No, no, not really. Lee is an English word. You can look it up in the dictionary. It is, an, it is a normal English word also, English-American, so I'm from the States, from Illinois. Actually, I've lived in six different states in two countries, but my last home before here was Illinois. Anyway, I have been here at the CTIL for two years and I'm an educational consultant, research professor, and I'm talking today about uh, conducting lectures and classes in English. Um, what I will talk about has to do not only with English lectures, uh, but lectures in general, so this would be a benefit to everyone. But in particular, I will talk about particular issues for you speaking in English, lecturing in English as non-native speakers of English, and for your students, making things easier for your students. So, I will talk first about planning, aspects of planning your lectures. Secondly, the visual presentation of your lectures. Third, issues related to rehearsal and delivery. And fourth, uh, student participation in a class that is conducted in English, or we call English-mediated courses. EMC or English Mediated Instruction uh, or EMI and I just gave you an outline of my talk and from memory and I'll show you a trick later on how to do that uh, how I did that first for students taking classes in English here and for uh, professors and Kangsa teaching in English especially the first time there's a certain element of fear uh, uh, which you can overcome, like I said, one, through the planning, through smart visual presentation, rehearsal, delivery, and understanding uh, how to encourage student participation. So, let's first look at the um, issues of planning your lectures and your teaching. Of course, uh, some people like, there are different ways of planning that work differently for different people. For some people, it might involve some brainstorming, loose brainstorming first, but eventually, you know, some people like graphic methods uh, like this, but um, nonetheless, you should eventually come to an outline, uh, sketch out an outline of your lecture if possible, or if you're using PowerPoint, that can be the basis of your outline, because it's going to help you to make the lecture organized, and so that you can also communicate the structure of your lecture to students. Usually an outline has three to five main points, and your lecture will usually have three to five main points. That is because this is human working memory. Our human working memory uh, works well if things are cut up into three to five points. It's easy to remember for students to keep in mind the structure of your lecture, especially if you begin by lecture, your lecture by stating the three to five main points points, about one slide per minute. Some of you might have to or feel pressured to organize your lecture based on the textbook and the textbook chapters, uh, and that's fine too. However, keep in, and this is especially the case in science and medicine and related fields where this, you and students have these huge, huge textbooks that are about this thick and weigh 50 kilograms, uh, and that's a lot of stuff. And the problem is, so much content, how do you lecture on it? Well, you don't, because it's too much for a lecture. If you try to pack in too much information into a lecture, the students won't really remember it. Um, you can go through a lot of information, you can dump a lot of information into their brains, but it's hard to begin with, and it's even harder when they have to do it in English, reading uh, books and listening to lectures in English. In that case, you have to sacrifice some of the contents. It will be maybe more helpful if, in your, if you use your lectures not to cover all possible contents, but instead to focus on the main points, the main concepts of the chapter. For the students, especially reading these huge chapters in English, it's an ocean of information. To them, it is an information dump. Uh, and it's too much for them to really handle. What you can do with your lectures is to touch on the main ideas of the chapter and how, what the key concepts are, uh, explore the key concepts more in depth, 
talk about how key ideas are related, key ideas, terms, concepts in the chapter are related to each other, how they're related to the main idea of the chapter, how they relate also to the contents of the course. Um, and after students understand the main ideas of the chapters, they can then go back and reread the chapters. And you can use your quizzes and tests and homework assignments to make sure that they do go back and reread them afterwards. Uh, so be careful about using contents. Um, the other important reason for using outlines is because, again, you can convey the structure to your students. You can um, plan transitions, transitional uh, expressions between major parts of your lecture, like, okay, we've talked about uh, A, now let's see what A has to do with B, or let's see how this relates to B, or let's see the implications of this for B. Notice I began that sentence with now, so now is a common English transitional expression for shifting to a new topic. And you might plan these transitional expressions. Uh, now starts a sentence and has an extra high intonation. That extra high intonation, like when I say blah, 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 now let's look at uh, section B. That extra high intonation gets their attention. Things like a clear structure, intonation, transitional expressions are important for getting their attention. For students sitting in a classroom, the average attention span is about 10 minutes. After about 10 minutes, the mind starts to wander, and you need to get their attention back. Uh, and actually, they'll start off with kind of, um, at the first 10 minutes, more mental energy, then their mind, their attention drops off, and it kind of comes back again, but it keeps going down more and more through the lecture uh, until the end. And so it's good to not just do a 50, 60 minute PowerPoint lecture, to break your lecture up with things like questions, um, jokes, uh, group activities, discussion activities, problem solving activities, rather than a 60 minute PowerPoint lecture which is kind of like watching TV for the students for an hour, very passive. So you want to make your lecture more interesting, more active. Um, so transitional expressions, that's one way to help them understand the flow of your thought, the flow of your ideas. And also good introductions. Uh, introductions are important um, because they help the students know what you're going to talk about and why. A good introduction will maybe um, provide a rationale. Why are we talking about this today? If you're lecturing on thermodynamics, you might begin by explaining why is thermodynamics important either for your career as an engineer or for the rest of this course or the rest of your major studies. Why is this important or relevant to you? Uh, also, maybe sometimes you begin with an interesting example or question to start them thinking. And what's uh, particularly important uh, many good introductions have an overview of the lesson. So if you say today we're going to talk about topic X, and in order to really understand topic X, we need to look at A, B, and C. And you briefly spell out, you know, what topic X is, why it's important, and then the subcomponents, so the main parts of your lecture, like A and what A is, and B and what B is, and C and what C is. So things like a rationale or an overview at the uh, or both at the beginning of your lecture are really important to help students know where you're going. And so when they get to the middle of the lecture and their mind wanders and they come back to you and you say, now let's go on to blah, 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 they remember from the introduction from the survey where you're going, where you have been and where you're going. And they maybe have some idea, hopefully, of why we're talking about this and why we're learning about this. Uh, next, visual presentation, aspects of visual presentation, uh, particularly PowerPoint design and also so how to use it and not use it. And uh, there are also alternatives to PowerPoint. You notice I'm not using PowerPoint. Uh, I'm using something else called Prezi. Have you heard of Prezi? Okay, and this is, well, Prezi is pretty cool. Right? Uh, people who are uh, more avant-garde and cool like to use Prezi, especially in education and some social sciences and humanities. Um, Prezi might be good for you. PowerPoint might be more appropriate for your content. 
Uh, for regular classes, I never use actually PowerPoint or Prezi. I use Prezi for special talks like this. But for the kind of material that I teach, I use myself and a whiteboard and handouts. For me, that works well. Uh, I teach things like academic writing, uh, uh, education related topics, for example. For, that, for the kinds of things I teach, I find that handouts, the whiteboard, and most of all, the teacher uh, works well. The problem with a PowerPoint-based lecture is the students are looking at the PowerPoint. The PowerPoint becomes the teacher. I, I like to be the teacher, not a PowerPoint. I like students to look at me and have a human teacher. If you use PowerPoint, you don't have to use it for the whole period. You can go back and forth. You can, um, you know, talk from the PowerPoint for a while, but then interact with the audience or do some other activity, break away from the PowerPoint, and that's really better for their attention and for their interest to not depend too much on PowerPoint. Uh, when we talk about PowerPoint or using PowerPoint, um, well, this is a common problem. This is death by PowerPoint or PowerPoint poisoning. So what causes PowerPoint poisoning? What are some No reaction. No reaction? Okay. That's actually a symptom of the disease. And what causes this disease? Because uh, they don't have to do um, you know, something, to write down something. Or okay. So the students aren't being asked to do anything. They're not being asked to write something or maybe discuss, maybe do a group activity where they do maybe a problem solving activity. It's all passive. And that's one problem, uh, one cause of PowerPoint poisoning. Uh, any other causes of PowerPoint poisoning? Get tired. Here, your eyes get tired because you're looking at the PowerPoint all the time. And again, it's if possible, it's better if you don't use PowerPoint for the entire class period and the entire lecture. Uh, again, if you break away from the PowerPoint and interact with the students or have them do an activity uh, or working on problems uh, or something like that. Also, if the speaker speaks in a monotone voice, uh, that's one of the worst uh, things. I, I once had a, I tried taking this class in graduate school. I, it seemed like an interesting, a very interesting topic, but the professor used PowerPoint all the time in a dark room and spoke in a monotone voice. And after two weeks, I hadn't learned anything. He never really got to the main content of the course. And it was so bad. Every day after class, I didn't feel just sleepy, but I felt like I was in a coma. Uh, that was. PowerPoint poisoning when PowerPoint. Lullaby. Pardon? It sounds like a lullaby. Lullaby. Oh, it's worse because it's a lullaby is generally pleasant. You have a good sleep, but a coma is not a <laughs> pleasant experience. Okay. Uh, especially the headache after being in a dark room, listening, I mean, watching the screen. Um, or here you go. Is this a good PowerPoint slide or PowerPoint presentation? Because this is actually fairly typical. What's wrong with this slide and this presentation? Okay, there's too much color. Okay, um, you're not trying to do a Walt Disney animation. Okay? <laughs> Simple color schemes. This is actually hard to see, hard to read. Simple high contrast color, like white text on black or dark blue. In that case, it's actually a little harder to so make the white text bigger and maybe bolder. Or more often, uh, black or dark color on white background or something that's high contrast and easy to see. Uh, also, the text is kind of small. And can you read the text back there? Hard to see, right? Uh, the text should be big enough or pictures or anything should be big enough so that everyone and see it, even those in the back. Um, what else do you see that's problematic? I think there are too many sentences. Too many sentences, too much text. PowerPoint is not designed to convey a lot of information. It is merely designed as a visual aid. So uh, maybe six lines, bullet points, short phrases, 
Uh, not whole sentences, uh, because it's too much to read. And another temptation is if you have a lot of text, you're going to probably turn your attention to the PowerPoint and read aloud the text, and you will fall into a monotone. That's what usually happens when you put too much text in a PowerPoint. The professor or the, the instructor will fall into monotone, not pay attention to the students, but pay attention to the PowerPoint. And so the PowerPoint is now the teacher, not the teacher. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, also the fact that Mr. Vader is standing in front of uh, the presentation, that's not good either. You don't want to block it. And I'm standing to the side. You can move around a little bit too. I know traditional Korean uh, professors like to stand in one spot. Um, you know, they don't move like statues. I don't think so. <laughs> um, a statue is not really the best teacher. Uh, students want to know that you're alive, um, that you're not a robot or a statue, so it helps to move around some. You don't have to move around like Steve Jobs. He does a very Western style where he moves around. I do this sometimes. Uh, maybe right now I'm more constricted by the technology like this thing. But typically I would move around some. Not too much. I don't want to seem like I've had too much coffee. But I move around some, and it keeps their attention on me. I'm not too static or stationary. Let's see, some other... What else? Uh, these are examples of common problems. Too much text, misuse of color. Um, again, for too much text, that's too much information. PowerPoint would be good for your outlines, your main talking points definitions, providing definitions of key words, uh, including definitions in Korean for, say, English words, because you're not supposed to, if it's an English class, you're not supposed to talk in Korean, but uh, you can put Korean definitions of technical terms in your PowerPoint, and you don't, they can just read it. And such. Uh, too much text, bad use of colors, colors that are not visible, or that are too flashy or bad looking. Um, these are examples of bad graphics. Uh, your graphics should be expanded, um, sized enough so that everyone can see it. Uh, maybe you need to expand this and maybe cut it up into several smaller pieces. Now with Prezi, with the software I use, what I could do is I could just draw a box or a frame and I could zoom in. With Prezi I could easily zoom in to part of an image, and that's the advantage of Prezi for a lot of images, and especially in biology and medicine. Uh, that's one advantage of Prezi. You can zoom into complex images, like complex medical or biological images. You can zoom in and they can see it. Um, otherwise, if you have a lot of information to give them, handouts might be better, or some other medium might be better. Uh, some more examples of bad graphics. Too many, several graphics into one slide, not good. <laughs> Somebody actually put this in a PowerPoint presentation in the US government office. This is really, really bad. Uh, it looks like um, spiders on drugs. Okay. Uh, this is cute, but does this belong in an academic presentation? No. Some people try to put in cute little graphics and such that are not really related to the lecture, so uh, I know it's really cute, but uh, if this is a lecture on engineering, this doesn't belong. Maybe if you're doing a food science or agriculture lecture, uh, well, okay, maybe you don't want to eat kitties, but okay, agriculture or something. Um, avoid reading from a script or reading from your slides. Again, that's very, very boring when the lecturer reads from slides or a script. Blah, 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 blah. Um, the reason is uh, the listeners are taking in information through two channels, the visual channel and the auditory channel. And if these are exactly the same, like if the person is reading aloud the slides, you're getting the same information, exact same information redundantly through two channels here and here, it's boring. Now if one complements the other, then that's better. If you have visual aids that complement what you're talking about, that's better. And if what you're talking about happens to go along nicely with well-done visual aids, that's good. 
Uh, again, use your slides for your outlines, your main ideas, your talking points. Not for a lot of information, though. Maybe for definitions. <coughs> uh, like I said, simple graphics, medium, large fonts, uh, not too much text. Um, simple, high, co high contrast color schemes and text that everyone can see. So consider the, the lecture room. Uh, again, your pictures should go along nicely with what you're talking about. There are alternatives to PowerPoint. If um, you're poor and you can't afford um, the high price that Microsoft pays, or if you just don't like Microsoft, which is true for me, I don't like, I don't use Microsoft. I don't even use Windows usually. I, I, I like Linux. Anybody use Linux? Okay. Um, for the average person, I would recommend Macintosh, uh, which is very friendly. Uh, anyway, for we're processing for presentation software, um, spreadsheets, there are several free alternatives. Um, they may not have all of the advanced features of Microsoft Office, but for a lot of people, especially st poor students, these are pretty good. Um, basically, IBM Lotus, Symphony, LibreOffice, OpenOffice, it's kind of all the same. Uh, I like IBM Lotus because it has a really nice graphical interface, and it's free, and the links are in the handout. Um, just to make your life easier, um, portable apps, if you're using, um, if you want to use a different browser, I never use Internet Explorer, it's slow, it doesn't have many features, it has security problems. Uh, I use Chrome or Firefox. Uh, so if you want to use these on a comp classroom computer and the software is not installed, you can install it onto your USB drive. Uh, I had a problem with the, the flash. Um, problem. But basically, on my flash drive, I have OpenOffice on here, I have Firefox, Chrome, Antivirus, and PDF Reader. And you can go to portableapps.com and install these onto your USB drive. And it can be really handy. You can just put them on here, plug it into any computer, and run it. <coughs> it's kind of nice. Um, antivirus. Also, if you're um, working on a public computer and a PC bong, and you want to check your email, you can use the browser that's installed on your USB, or if you're doing something that's insecure, uh, or if you're at an internet cafe in Kathmandu and you don't trust the security. Uh, may, have you heard of Dropbox? Has anyone heard of Dropbox? Okay, This is more of a thing to make your life easier. I used to work on files at home at the office, and I would have to remember to bring my USB or my um, external hard drive and then sometimes I would forget and I would have to go back. Well, not anymore with Dropbox. Uh, I can install this program on my home and office computers and I can work on files on the Dropbox folder on one computer, say at my office. I go home and it's there on my home computer when I get home. And if I need a file, uh, this in, so this installs on your computers and it basically operates like a, just a regular folder that synchronizes automatically between your computers. And on the handout there is a, uh, a promotional code, you can use my promotional code and if you do that both of us get extra, so you get two gigabytes free and if you use say my promotional code, you and I would both get uh, 500 megabytes extra bonus. Uh, so you can start up with 2.5 gigs. And if you get your friends to use your bonus code, then you and your friend can get extra memory. Um, it's pretty reliable. It works for Windows, Linux, Macintosh, Android, iPhone, iPad. Uh, it's pretty good. Um, it works very well, pretty reliable. Uh, also, if I'm on a public computer, like a classroom computer, and I need a file, I can log into my Dropbox account through a browser and then download it through the browser interface, too, if I forgot kind the of file. If you have Gmail, you have Google Drive, which is kind of similar. It's not quite as good yet as Dropbox, but it has five gigabytes, uh, almost as good as Dropbox, uh, I think. <coughs> SmartDraw is a graphics program that can make nice flow charts and diagrams and um, you can contact the CTL eLearning team uh, about Dropbox. 
if you're an Apple user, there's Keynote, which is their alternative to Office. Uh, do any of you use LaTeX, the science, engineering, math people? If you use LaTeX, there are two document classes in LaTeX, Beamer and Prosper, that can be used to produce um, slide-style PDFs. So it's basically a PDF that operates like a um, presentation, like slides. And you can put a nice navigation bar here on the side. You can click back and forth between that navigation bar between different parts of your lecture. And that's really cool. That's something that PowerPoint cannot do. So for your, you science and math people who use LaTeX, that's pretty good. Uh, or if you just need a, uh, an equation or formula, you can go to this website. That's also, I think, on your notes. Uh, you can go to this website and use LaTeX syntax to create a formula or equation and then download it as a graphic file and take that graphic file, put it into your PowerPoint or your Prezi uh, or your handout. Uh, it's pretty cool. That's the LaTeX syntax and that's the formula. Uh, again, this is Prezi. Go to Prezi.com. Uh, I think that handout, that site is in your handout. Basically, it's like a big canvas and you're just zooming around a canvas. So this is kind of non-linear. PowerPoint makes you follow kind of a linear uh, format and that may work for some kinds of topics. For some kinds of topics, a non-linear um, format might be kind of nice. This is kind of more artsy and more cool. You just basically move around a nice canvas and it's fairly easy to use and to learn. So that's what I'm using right now. Uh, you use a whiteboard, but not like this. Uh, I like to use whiteboard, but it should be nice and neat, big, right big, so that everyone can see neatly, kind of go down in columns like this, and this across the whiteboard, <coughs> and write large and neatly. And most of all is, okay, handouts are also good, don't forget handouts. And of course, the most important thing is you should be the teacher, not the PowerPoint. Rehearsal issues, uh, especially if you're, uh, if you're lecturing in English as a second language. It's important maybe to rehearse. If you have the time, you can rehearse, uh, do a full rehearsal on your own, uh, maybe at home or an empty, empty classroom. If not, you can at least rehearse part of it, part of a lecture, maybe while you're in the shower, uh, or mentally rehearse going through a lecture. Uh, it's helpful to rehearse multiple times if you've not lectured on you know, a particular class before. Because a problem for lecturers who are speaking in English as a second language, you've got to do a problem. You have to focus on the content. But it's easy to get distracted and try to focus on the English and worry about your English. During a lecture, that can actually make you distracted and can make you nervous or make it hard to deliver a fluent, um, smooth flowing lecture. So it's better to rehearse the English aspects before your lecture. And during the lecture, don't worry about your English. Don't worry about your grammar or your pronunciation, because that will distract you. Some people actually try to memorize talks and lectures beforehand. And whether that's your first or second language, again, that's making your mind do dual tasking, which you cannot do. During a lecture, you need to focus on the contents, not the language. And if you're trying to memorize it, you're focusing on the language and contents at the same time, and that doesn't work. So it's better to rehearse um, beforehand, at least mentally rehearse and go through, say, the lecture structure, organization, outline, and also then separately rehearse things like grammar, pronunciation, um, words that might be difficult for you. It's better to rehearse that separately. So maybe rehearse uh, multiple times or separately rehearse the contents of your lecture, the organization of your lecture, and the English, or the language aspects, separately uh, and not all at once. And in terms of the language, that would include maybe uh, vocabulary, pronunciation, uh, your intonation. Intonation is more important in English than in Korean, so you have to put extra effort and extra energy into your intonation. <coughs> uh, 
Uh, two other kind of psychological tricks. One can be visualization, uh, and that goes along with mentally rehearsing a lecture. If you mentally visualize yourself doing a good lecture, that can help you. Not that there's anything magic or new agey about visualization strategies, but sometimes visualizing yourself doing a good lecture uh, helps you to think about the things that you need to do in order to do a good lecture. Uh, the things you need to do in order to interact with the audience, to make it interesting, to do your tr put in transitional expressions, to provide good explanations. So kind of visualizing and mentally rehearsing uh, is a helpful way of making yourself think about what you need to do and help you to do a better lecture. Uh, memory tricks. Um, what I did earlier, I gave you the introduction to my talk and I used a memory trick, uh, locus or location trick. Uh, I told you I was going to talk about planning and organization, uh, about presentation, uh, visual presentation techniques, rehearsal delivery, and student participation. And notice I'm kind of pointing to the different parts of the room. This is an ancient trick for um, public speaking. I, uh, the first part of my lecture is planning issues, and I, in that part of the room, I've kind of created a mental image, uh, something interesting or weird in my mind. I have, in my memory, I kind of associated with that corner of the room. So I just kind of look over there or think, okay, that's uh, planning, uh, planning a lecture over there. I imagine maybe a huge monitor, or I imagine somebody presenting. That reminds me of presentation, a uh, visual presentation. Over there, I imagine maybe in a very strange or funny way, somebody or something rehearsing. And over here, delivery. Okay, I can imagine maybe a delivery truck, or delivery. Uh, something strange, weird, very active. <clears throat> and so I don't have to get lost in my lecture. I can just look at the different parts of the room and know where I am. Uh, especially for special presentations, this is a useful trick. And for planning, I could put sub points. I could put planning over here, then I can kind of come out here and maybe have other mental images that remind me of sub points when you're planning, and same for over there. Or I can have delivery. I can imagine something here to remind me of delivery, and then uh, maybe a delivery truck driver gets out and does other things that reminds me of the sub points of my talk under delivery. Uh, so if you look for mnemonics, there are plenty of helps on the web on memory tricks like this. Uh, pronunciation. Uh, now there's a more detailed uh, handout, the last I think two, one or two pages of your handout. We talk about pronunciation, and that's kind of some explanation you can read on your own. I'll just walk you through uh, major aspects of pronunciation because I do hear sometimes students say, I have trouble understanding that professor because of his pronunciation. Um, so the main aspects of pronunciation, well, the most important thing is stress patterns and intonation. You could pronounce the vowels and the consonants correctly and still be misunderstood. One time I was listening to a professor of psychiatry talking about um, there's a medical term called somatoform disorder, somatoform. But whenever he said somatoform, in his Konglish pronunciation, it sounded like smartphone disorder, smartphone <laughs> disorder. Somatoform, smartphone, it sounded exactly the same. So I know whether the patient is not happy, his, I, his um, Android isn't working or something. Uh, it wasn't so much his vowels and consonants that was somewhat of a problem, but mainly the stress patterns and intonation. That's really important in English. Uh, Korean is a relatively monotonal language, and every syllable has the same length. It is the opposite in English. Syllables do not have the same length. Stress syllables are much longer and louder and have a pitch change. Your pitch or intonation goes up and down. Maybe up, maybe down, but often up and down. So there's a pitch change on stressed syllables. And we have some we have syllables that are more stressed than others, and then we have unstressed syllables. Uh, so when you're rehearsing, maybe you need to exaggerate the intonation to help you um, pronounce the word more intelligibly, like somatoform. 
maybe need to exaggerate. Practice by exaggerating, like deoxyribonucleic acid. You know, there's a sort of rhythm that you can uh, exaggerate. Thermodynamics, maybe exaggerate. Practice by exaggerating at home. Hopefully, your family members won't think you're strange. <coughs> uh, that's true with word stress. Uh, also with compound stress, compound words, like compound stress. That's a compound word, and compound has more stress than stress. Uh, in a compound word, uh, usually the first part has more stress than the other words in a compound. Uh, then there's also kind of a main stress in a sentence or clause. And it, usually the, the main idea of a sentence is usually in kind of the, the verb phrase, at or toward the end of a sentence. And if you listen to me, toward the end of my sentences, there's an extra high intonation, an extra, uh, an extra level of stress. And that tells people the main idea of my sentences and my flow of thought. So if you listen to English speakers, they will usually, better ones will usually have a clear sentence stress. Each clause will have maybe one word, usually near the end, that has more intonation, more stress, more volume than the others. So it's maybe helpful to go to listen to some of those speakers and imitate them. Uh, with vowels, of course, common problems of the A sounds and the O sounds, those are extra long. It's not just A, but A, like in uh, they and fade or nitrate. It's not nitrate, nitrate. Uh, you don't say like nitrate unless you're Scottish. Uh, it's nitrate, A, nitrate, uh, abate. A base, A, it's like A and E together, A, it flows together. It's extra long compared to the Korean A. Uh, also the O like in boat, it's not bought, it's actually different, like I bought a boat. Uh, it's not um, like the Korean O, which is a simple vowel, it's extra long, it's an O, O and O, O, like boat, like I bought a boat uh, in Korea. And the, for the short i, like in bit, it's, your tongue is relaxed and it's, very, it's shorter than e. For e, your, t your tongue is a muscle and your tongue tenses like a muscle, um, just like any other muscle of the body. It would be tense, like for e, it's tense, and it's long because it's tense. For i, like in bit, it's relaxed and short. Just imagine the dentist is giving you like a Novocaine shot, bit, you know, not beat, but bit. Um, and the same for the uh, for the uh sound, like this unstressed vowel, extra short, uh, extra light, like abate, this uh in abate. It's very short, it may be very hard to hear. Uh, anyway, there's more in your handout. Uh, consonants, well, these are tricky. First of all, the Z is not like a G at all. The Z is just like an S. This is kind of hard for you. So you start with an S, you put your hand on your throat, now just vibrate. So your tongue position is exactly the same, but just create vibration here. Do you feel that? You go back and forth between S and Z. That's the Z. That's all you have to do. It's easy. Uh, they didn't teach you this, uh, probably, because typical English education here has neglected pronunciation. The Z is exactly like an S, your tongue position and everything, except that you have vibration here. Uh, yeah, seems fun, huh? <laughs> Practice that at home and see if your family members scare you. Uh, also problematic are these English sounds, sh, like sh, zh, and again, it's the, this is, these are different in terms of vibration, sh, zh, zh, and zh, But these are different from, very different from the Korean jit and jit and sang jit. For these Korean jit sounds, your tongue is flat, and you're using kind of the, this part of your tongue to touch the top part of the mouth, like t, like t, t, uh, and also the xi, like I, I just see the xi, like, like, like in xigan, uh, also the xi is like that too. For these English sounds, your tongue is curled up, and the tip of the tongue is touching or coming close to the top of the mouth. It's very different, like, uh, like judge and church and English. And your tongue has to be curled up like this. Uh, uh, English, 
something like that. Your tongue tip is pointing toward the top of the mouth like this. Not like this, but like this. So the problem is when Koreans pronounce these English sounds with a flat tongue, um, it's, it's a distinctive aspect of Konglish accent. And also it makes it hard to end the word with that sound, like hachim. And so you end up with Korean saying Englishy instead of English, fishy instead of fish, and churchy instead of church. And so if your tongue is properly shaped, it's easier to do the proper pachim, like fish. Not fishy, but fish. Because fishy is konglishy, not English. <laughs> <laughs> Same as for judge, church, beige, uh, tongue curled up and touching here. here. So you practice that at home. Uh, and there's an, um, a website in your handout, the Iowa Phonetics website. You can actually see flash diagrams of the English sounds and how, what, how the mouth moves. <clears throat> so any questions about the pronunciation of English? Because this is actually a tricky thing. And, uh, actually, I could give a whole lecture on English pronunciation. <clears throat> actually, I do sometimes. <clears throat> Um, so, these palatal consonants, the vowel length, vowel quality, but most of all, the stress and intonation. <clears throat> Another example of stress and intonation, one time I was asking a, a Korean friend of mine, who is going to lead the meeting, I was asking her about a meeting, and she said, uh, she was trying to say, Willie, W-I, yes, she was trying to say, whoa, I don't know if you can read that, bad marker. <clears throat> She's trying to say this guy's name, Willie, uh, which has a clear stress here, and this is unstressed. But she was putting equal stress on both syllables. So to me, it sounded like she was saying, will lead. Like, I thought she was just echoing my question. Uh, she was trying to say, Willie, but she was pronouncing it, Willie, which sounded like something different. So Koreans tend to put equal stress on syllables, which will make it sound Konglish or make it hard to understand. So there's a very important rhythm in English that comes from the stress system. Uh, now besides pronunciation, that's something you can work on in your rehearsal time. Um, aspects of vocal delivery have to do with audience interaction. Your their voice quality, and again I'll mention transitionals because they come up again here, and then also practically how to deal with nervousness. So, audience interaction, uh, you probably know these two guys. One is, of course, the late Steve Jobs, who is in, considered one of the best public speakers. And also, you probably know uh, Michael Sandel, the Justice series of lectures. Uh, he's also a very good speaker. Uh, a very good public speaker and very interesting, which is unusual for a philosophy professor. Uh, if you've known philosophy professors, they do t tend to be pretty weird and not know how to talk to people, uh, as my philosophy professor was in college. Um, he's actually quite good, very articulate. And these two guys, they know how to talk, they know how to deliver their, um, their lectures. The voice quality, the energy, the interaction with the audience, uh, and they also know how to handle nervousness. So in terms of... Uh, well, we'll talk about these. First of all, enthusiasm and energy. <coughs> Lecturing takes energy. Teaching takes energy. Even more so in English because you need more intonation. And that goes along with the stress system of English. That requires more energy to produce that intonation in English. And that's on top of just the energy that it takes to lecture. So. First of all, some important things for energy. It is important, first of all, for keeping audience interest. Uh, if you sound tired or bored, then your students will probably become tired and bored also. But if the teacher has energy and shows that I'm passionate about what I'm teaching, then that will transfer to the students and make the students more motivated and interested in their learning. Some simple physiological things first. Proper sleep, proper exercise, proper diet. By diet I mean eating habits. <clears throat> but during or right before a lecture actually um, water is the best thing to drink. Um, not too cold. Um, water that's kind of
cool or lukewarm is better for your vocal cords. Coffee is not good right before or during a lecture. Uh, I, if I'm teaching, I have my coffee at home early before I teach because caffeine, especially coffee, can make your throat feel dry. It can dry the vocal cords and that's not good. Water is really the best thing or maybe tea that has no caffeine or sugar <coughs> while you're talking. Also things like sugar and carbohydrates are not good. Um, that includes even fruit juices because fruit juices have extra added sugar usually. Sodas, I know some people who like to drink sodas when they talk, um, that's actually not good. Or drinks, have a snack right before class or candy. Um, that's really not so good. A lot of people think they'll get an energy boost from that, but the truth is uh, that stuff goes into your system, to your stomach, and then through your blood, into your bloodstream. But after about 20 minutes, the sugar is removed. The body actually cannot tolerate sugar or carbo carbohydrates in the bloodstream for a long time. It's poisonous to the cells. So the body releases insulin. You know, insulin? Um, insulin is a hormone that the body releases <coughs> to the body releases insulin in order to trap the sugar or carbohydrates and store it as either triglycerides, which is a, a fatty material in your blood, or to store it as fat. Uh, and so after 20 minutes, you lose that energy. You might get an energy high or an energy boost for 10 or 15 minutes, but after 20 minutes, you go down, uh, tired or more tired than before. So it's not good to depend on energy for energy, uh, to depend on sugar or carbohydrates for energy, or too much caffeine. Uh, it's actually better if you exercise regularly. If you exercise regularly, um, you'll have more energy. And from exercising and losing weight, I actually have more energy for teaching than I used to. Um, I don't need to rely so much on uh, caffeine. And also, uh, some exercises, especially jogging, are good for your lung capacity, which you need in order to teach, to project your voice, uh, and to have energy. <clears throat> Some other aspects. Okay, voice quality. When you're talking, you're using actually a muscle down here called the diaphragm. Um, this is something that I've had to, I've had actually come get to know my diaphragm muscle in the recent years. <coughs> when I started teaching years ago, I was teaching a lot of classes, and I found my voice was really sore, really hoarse by the end of the day uh, because I wasn't using my voice properly. And this became a problem again, uh, maybe a couple of years ago, I got bronchitis, like P1Z bronchitis, and it, I had it for a long time, and it did permanent damage to my voice because I wasn't able to rest properly. And so today I have a weak voice, but I've compensated by learning to use the diaphragm muscle. So a lot of new teachers overuse the, vo the, throat, muscle, the throat and the vocal cords. Uh, and it can make them sore or tired or even damaged if you keep doing it. Uh, new teachers rely too much on the throat and the vocal cords in a way that can actually damage or hurt or strain your throat muscles and your vocal cords. Uh, and it will make your voice tired or sore. Instead, what you want to do is use the diaphragm muscle. And it's especially true uh, for people who are not used to public speaking, also for ladies who have soft voices, uh, it's important to learn to use this to project your voice. So what I'm doing is I'm sucking in my stomach muscles, I'm tensing my stomach muscles, and that tenses the diaphragm, and so I'm using my diaphragm to project my voice. If I weren't, by now I would have really trouble talking right now if I weren't doing that. And even during the day when I'm not talking, I try to remember, just as an exercise, to tense my stomach muscles. It's kind of good for strengthening your stomach muscles. Uh, and that pushes up your diaphragm and makes you use your diaphragm more. And again, also jogging is good for this too. Um, there are also some diaphragm exercises you can do. If you have friends who are singers, they can show you some diaphragm exercises. Uh, one diaphragm exercise is to tense your stomach muscles, push your hand here in your diaphragm right below your lungs 
and just slowly breathe in and breathe out. And you do this maybe for several minutes, uh, maybe in the morning, uh, and pushing in on your diaphragm. Like, Actually, I should do it more slowly than that. And you can also do this and then kind of vocalize a vowel when you exhale. Like, ah. Uh, I know it sounds silly. You probably want to do this when you're alone uh, at home uh, so that people don't think you're strange. Uh, but doing this for several minutes a day is also a diaphragm exercise that you can uh, do. Uh, personally, although I found jogging to be the best thing, and also just remembering to maybe spending several minutes a day just tensing, remembering to tense my stomach muscles. And then when I lecture, I try as much as I can to consciously tense the stomach muscles. And I'm also imagining, just imagining I'm projecting my voice to the back of the room. And just imagining that and trying to project your voice and also make your lungs and your muscles do what they need to do to project your voice. So strong diaphragm muscles, especially if you have voice problems, or if you have a very soft voice, and it's very important to use that so you don't hurt yourself. <clears throat> also, rehearse enough and have enough self-confidence so you're not going, uh, 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 such. That's kind of distracting. Uh, usually people put those in toward the middle of the sentence so after you maybe give your subject of the sentence for the verb. Uh, maybe you tend to put in uh and um because you're trying to think of the rest of the sentence. That's where people get stuck. It's maybe better to have unfilled pauses. These things like uh and um are pause fillers, they fill pauses. Maybe sometimes you can just not fill. See what I just did, I just stopped for a second, and then I continued. I'm not filling my pauses. Uh, sometimes that can be a way of getting their attention. Because if you just go uh, um, um, they're going to realize or think you're not confident, you're not prepared. Instead, I just stop for a second, in the middle of my sentence and go on. And that might make them pay attention a little bit more when you have silent pauses. If you use silent pauses, instead of going uh and um, just use a little silence once in a while. <clears throat> Posture and body language are also important. Some things you need to maybe exercise. There are certain things that can convey nervousness. Uh, if you're holding on to not to for too long, now occasionally I might rest my arm on the podium, but I've seen some people like hold on to the podium or like, like this, like they're afraid they're going to float away, like they don't trust the Earth's gravity. Also, if you're kind of covering your body, that suggests nervousness. If uh, they're doing a lot of this or this or this, that might be from nervousness or might convey nervousness. Or this might also convey I'm proud and arrogant too especially to East Asian audiences. Um, or maybe doing this, this is maybe, uh, maybe in the West we might do this a little bit just to show that I'm really confident. But I think in East Asian culture this doesn't look as good. Um, so be careful with this or uh, with this, which especially in East Asian culture I'm told is not so good because this looks, uh, I guess for East Asians this might seem like kind of arrogant or lazy. For, for Westerners, this is maybe more lazy. Well, in Western culture, if I do this a little bit, if I just do this for a little bit, that might be okay. That might like kind of cool, relaxed. In Western culture, if I do this too much, then it's kind of lazy. But I think for East Asian culture, it's even worse because it might be seen as arrogant or we don't care. What else? If you're rubbing yourself too much, like this, or like this, or holding yourself, or you know, maybe rubbing yourself like this, those are also signs of nervousness. Uh, I like to have my hand bending kind of, this is kind of ready posture, ready position. Sometimes like this, like this. Or I use my hands and arms for flow gestures. This helps me to uh, flow, convey flow of thought. Uh, sometimes I might point to the slides, kind of emphasize things, or emphasize gestures like this, or like this. I might be. Uh, if you don't know what to do with your hand, you can have like a pointer and pointing clicking device in one hand and notes in the other hand, or or just one hand you're using your device and the other hand you might have out here and bring it into motion sometimes for gestures like this or like this. Uh, maybe look at good speakers like Michael Sandel, Steve Jobs, and others. Uh, if you're not sure what to do with your arms and hands, maybe look at good public speakers 
and learn from their use of body language. Because sometimes body language can uh, convey nervousness. If you can control that, that might make you a little less nervous. <clears throat> Other body language, you know, rubbing your face too much, not do things you do that. Uh, or holding things behind your back. This might mean like, uh, well, the psychological meaning literally is like I'm kind of hiding something from you, but it can also mean nervousness. Um, many, many kinds of unnatural gestures can convey nervousness or be a sign of nervousness. Um, audience interaction is helpful to look at the audience, make eye, make eye contact. Maybe not with every student, but at least with some students in different parts of the room. Ask questions. Um, speak slowly, especially for your students who are not used to English lectures, yet it helps to speak slowly and with greater intonation. Uh, maybe uh, it might be important if you know a lot of uh, informal English slang, colloquial or informal expressions or uh, idioms, it might not be good to show off your knowledge of English to your students um, because their English is perhaps more basic than yours. Some of you might have spent time in the U.S. or Australia or England and, and picked up a lot of informal English, but your students may not understand it unless you explain it to them first. Like I said, don't read a lot of slides and all of that. Talk to your audience. Um, again, as I mentioned, transitional expressions. And my website address is one of the handouts. And you can go to my website and get a and out on transitional expressions, or um, sometimes we call them signposting because these provide kind of signposts or markers to the audience of where you're going with your lecture, or kind of highlight things like uh, now, blah, 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 blah. So that kind of uh, transition marker, transition to a new topic. Now I'd like to talk about the, an extra high information, or uh, we've talked about X, now let's move on to Y, or um, this bears repeating, or this is really important. Things like that. So on my website, you go to the EAP page, that's English for Academic Purposes, for handouts like this. And it's about an 18 page list of transitional expressions for classroom use. And also um, another site, another uh, page on pedagogical or teaching aids, which you can go to for help. Um, my EAP, EAP site also has a few things on pronunciation. So there are a lot of these. You can go to get my handout and practice with them in your lecture. And nervousness. If you're a new teacher, boy, nervousness might be a, uh, a big thing. Nervousness is often misunderstood. A lot of people worry because they're nervous. And they think, because I'm nervous, that means I'm not going to do well. Uh, not necessarily true. There is excessive nervousness. Too much nervousness can be bad, but there's a sort of nervousness that's natural. So there's a certain level of nervousness that's good, that's natural, and it's okay. Uh, and there's excessive nervousness. So first of all, with good nervousness, there's a normal level of nervousness, especially if you're relatively new. Uh, it does not mean that you're not prepared, necessarily. Uh, it may mean maybe you do need to do more rehearsal so you feel more confident and more prepared. But oftentimes nervousness is simply the, the brain's way of reacting to an important or stressful situation. It is simply the brain's uh, response to an important situation by kind of bringing together extra mental energy and extra attentional energy, extra energy for attention. So, Good speakers like Steve Jobs, Michael Sandel, are probably at least somewhat nervous when they give their big talks. They don't look nervous, but good speakers learn to use nervous energy uh, because you need that nervous energy. It is actually something your brain is giving you so that you can use. So you take that nervous energy and you use it uh, for the energy you need for your voice to project your voice to use intonation, and to show enthusiasm about your topic, to show enthusiasm about your lecture, uh, to have social enthusiasm in interacting with your students during the class. Uh, that's important. Uh, 
and also to focus on your contents. You want to focus mainly on your contents, you want your mental energy to focus on what you're saying and the contents, the ideas that you're trying to convey. Now there is excessive inner, uh, nervousness, which may be because you're too worried about what people will think of you. Um, so if you're excessively nervous, it may be because you're too worried about your performance and what people think of you. In that case, maybe you need to forget about trying to impress people, maybe forget about being a perfectionist, a perfectionist to have this, trouble, this problem, and instead focus on the content, uh, first on the contents, and secondly on interacting with the students. So focus more on the contents and not your performance. And in fact, you have to allow yourself a certain freedom to fail as a teacher, especially during your first year. So you have to realize you're going to make mistakes and that's okay. Uh, a lot of people, especially Koreans, tend to be perfectionistic. They want to be perfect, but that actually gets in the way of your learning and your personal growth. So as a teacher, allow yourself some freedom to make mistakes, to make uh, mistakes in lecturing and teaching, and learn from those mistakes. Because making mistakes is an important part of the learning process, and you are learning to be teachers. Even if you've taught for a while, you're still learning. Uh, and so that can be the source of excessive nervous energy that gets in the way. Uh, also, you can learn from good speakers. There's some references on the handout for um, TED.com, where you can see good speakers from uh, people from government, education, academia, um, business industry. You give talks to kind of they're not, they're not really academic talks, but they are to intelligent, educated audience. And these are really good talks, usually better public speakers on TED.com. Uh, OpenCourseWare, there are references on your handout for OpenCourseWare. These are, these are um, video lectures from university classes that many universities have made public. Kode, Suke, Harvard, MIT, Stanford, Berkeley. You can um, find great examples, including professors from your field, and learn from their examples in my invitation. Uh, last part is student participation. What I hear from professors is they want to get their students involved in class, but if, especially in English, a class that's taught in English, the students don't want to respond. They ask a question, nobody wants to respond. A common problem because one, because of the hierarchy, students think they shouldn't talk in class. The, teacher or the professor should be the, um, the source of all knowledge and wisdom, uh, almost sort of like a god, and they don't want to speak up in class. But also because they're shy about English. They don't want to talk in English in class. They don't want classmates to think they're not so good because their English is broken because of their English. Some ways of getting around this, <coughs> uh, asking good questions, interactive activities, pre-class quizzes and um, write-ups. Well, um, asking good questions, some types of good questions to make sure you're asking good questions, not just asking them to repeat information back to you, but it's maybe better to have questions that are kind of analytical questions, make them analyze ideas, uh, make them evaluate ideas. Uh, do you think this is good or not? Do you agree with this? Evidential questions. Um, can you think of some more evidence for this claim that I have made? Uh, or what is the evidence for this theory? What is the evidence for this claim? Make them think and put it into their own words. Uh, make them clarify concepts and terms. I've talked about this. Can you explain it? Uh, uh, application or extension questions. We've been learning about X. How would you apply X to this kind of situation? Uh, ask them questions. Like that, it can be hypothetical questions, questions about cause and effect, what's the relationship between X and Y. Uh, ask them to summarize or synthesize ideas or summarize what you've been talking about. Open-ended questions where you make them think. Uh, even then, they may be, of course, unwilling or reticent to respond if it's one-on-one. -on -one. And often the problem is if you are asking one-on-one -on -one questions. If I say, I point to you and I say, Explain X. Um, we're going to freeze. You get this kind of look like, as we say in English, a deer in 
headlights. When the deer is on the road and it sees headlights, it's actually blinded by car headlights and it freezes because it doesn't know what to do, it's blinded. Uh, and that's a common uh, phenomenon for Korean students. Um, they don't want to talk in class in English in front of their classmates. Uh, they also need time to think of what to say. So a good way around this is instead of doing direct one-on-one -on -one questions, is to put them maybe into pairs first. Put them into pairs and give them the question. Uh, turn it into an interactive activity. Uh, give them the question. Okay, turn to a neighbor and discuss this question for a minute, and then tell me what you think. And after a minute of discussing a question in pairs or small groups, say, okay, what did your come up with, what did you all think? Uh, things like that. And this could be, over time, you can build up to maybe small group activities. If they get used to short pair exercises, then you can build up to, sh to small group activities, maybe th you know, three minutes or five minutes or 15 minutes, and give them increasingly more complex questions, uh, building up to maybe problem solving activities, where you give them a problem to solve, and then you call on some groups to report their ideas or their thoughts. So this is how you build up to interactive activities in class, make things more interactive by using peer work and group work. It may be less intimidating and scary for them than if I say, okay, what do you think, or what's your answer, one-on-one uh, -on -one questions. <coughs> um, other things you can do uh, to overcome one the, the language problem is this, um, if it's at the end of class, and I say, okay, do you have any questions? And they're probably, because, they're sh because of the shyness issue and the social dynamic, they're probably going to say no, or they won't really say anything, even if they do have questions. Or if they say, did you understand this? Or do you all understand? They say, yeah, no. Because they don't want to either look dumb or um, speak up for various reasons, because of the authority of the teacher or they're shy about English. Um, at the end of class, instead, what you can do is this. So if you have five minutes, get out a piece of paper and uh, explain to me in your own words um, this concept that I've explained to you today. Explain this in your own words. Or what was the main point of my lecture? Or what did you learn today about this? Or we've talked about X. How would you apply X to a situation like Y? Maybe an application or problem solving question. Or what is something you didn't understand from my lecture today? Or what are some things or some terms that you still don't quite understand? Or what questions do you have about this topic? Something like this. You can do this as kind of a final end of class writing assignment. This could be maybe a, you can do this semi-regularly and make it a small, small component of their grade. You can also do this before class especially if they are not reading their textbook and they really need to. So let's say, um, well, next week we're going to look at chapter six in our textbook. Um, so what I want you to do is I post, I'm going to post some questions on my website or from EKU, which you can reply to. Uh, you can, they can reply directly through EKU or through email or whatever. And it might be these kinds of questions about the chapter. So before you actually lecture on the chapter, you want to make sure they've read it. Of course, it could be afterwards, but it could be before. Uh, and so you give them a few questions, maybe one or two questions that are kind of open-ended, where they actually have to write out maybe a few sentences. Um, and you could make it multiple choice, but if it's just multiple choice, they might copy from their classmates. Unless you say, okay, A, B, C, or D, but then explain your answer in uh, several sentences. Um, so, and then they send it to you through EKU, and that's a way of getting, to think, getting them to think about the topic before class, getting them to read the textbook chapter before class. And then in class, you can actually go over some of the responses. You can see where they had difficulties and talk about those. You can um, come up with a follow-up question in class for a group discussion or pair discussion activity. Uh, do something with it in the class so that when they feel like it was a use, they actually are doing it for a reason and then you actually do something in class based on that exercise, kind of a pre-class homework or mini quiz, where they actually have to engage with the chapter and do something about it. Uh, 
uh, we don't have time to look at a lecture, uh, I think it's almost time, but um, on the second page of the handout, there's sort of, sort of basic criteria for evaluating a lecture. And what you might want to do is maybe find some of your favorite lectures on TED.com or OCW sites, uh, maybe academic lectures on YouTube, uh, and kind of look at the lecture and you know, go through those criteria on page two, kind of critique a sample lecture, and or you could videotape yourself and critique your own lecture. Uh, might be kind of scary, but it's a good learning exercise. So kind of critique, is the structure good? Is there a good introduction? Are there, those elements of the introduction there, are there good transitional expressions? What transitional expressions did the person use? Uh, was the presentation uh, good? Was the vocal delivery effective? Was the person interesting? We see, for example, Michael Sandel in his Justice series. He's lecturing to maybe 500 freshman kids uh, at Harvard in a classroom, 500 it looks like. But he still makes it interactive. He gives really interesting examples, um, kind of moral scenarios, and they actually get some of the students to come to the microphone and give their thoughts, and he, uh, and he plays them sometimes against each other, okay? So like, uh, you think this is perfectly moral, you disagree, why do you disagree with her? You kind of play students with each other. Michael Sandel does it very well. So look at uh, online lectures like that, and critique them, and then learn from them. And finally, you've got my website, my email address there, if you have questions. And that is all for today. Any questions? Probably going to say no. Do <laughs> <laughs> you understand? Yeah. <laughs> That's Korean students too. All right. Thank you. Good luck with you.